Hey, this is Mr. Aiden. Welcome to Pre-AP Chemistry. And we're going to be starting off with Unit 1, Atomic Structure. And this is Week 1. And what are we going to learn in Week 1? Well, we're going to learn about the models of the atom, the atomic structure of protons, neutrons, and electrons, atomic mass, and ionic charge, and at last, mass spectroscopy. So let's get started with this Unit 1, Atomic Structure and Models of the Atom. Uh, the Models of the Atom goes back to about 400, 500 B.C., and you can see there's two dudes, two old dead Greek dudes, uh, both philosophers. One's name was Aristotle on the left. One's name is Democritus on the right. Aristotle came up with his model of the elements or what everything is made up of, which was water, fire, earth, and air. And what do you know? Democritus came up with his model of, of what everything is made up of. And he said everything is made up of these small, little, indivisible, indestructible particles called Atomos. And of course, both of them did nothing scientific. It was all philosophy. And Mr. Democritus is a lot closer to our modern view of the atom. But everyone believed in Aristotle because, of course, he played with Plato. And jump ahead to about eight, the 1800s. And here's John Dalton, who actually uses scientific experimentation to develop his first model of the atom. And his looks a lot like Democritus. It's a solid sphere model. And he recognized that all atoms, he said, was tiny, indivisible particles, indestructible particles, uh, that he, he said they were all different for different elements. And every element, say an iron atom or a, uh, or a copper atom, these were distinctly different, but all iron atoms all were the same. They were all the same. And he didn't know one of the big disadvantages to his model was he didn't know anything was inside of it. No subatomic particles, and obviously he didn't know anything about what we're going to learn of isotopes or ions, that there were different types of each one of those elements. Well, comes along J.J. Thompson about 100 years later, and he recognized that there were these little particles inside of the atom called electrons. He used what's called um, the, the cathode ray experiment, and he found out when he shot a bunch of uh, electrons and he put them with, or particles, and he put them within a magnetic field, they ended up attracting the positive but repelling the negative, which means he said that there was this, these negative particles uh, labeled electrons inside of the atom. Uh, but it, what, what's the big disadvantage of his model is he knew nothing about the nucleus. He didn't know that there was any positively. He, he just thought this kind of this cookie part was positive and these chocolate chips were negative there. Well, jump ahead to Ernie Rutherford. Ernie Rutherford used what's called the gold foil experiment, and he found out that there was this, this positive nucleus inside, and it was positively charged. It was very massive, but very, very small. But most of the atom was empty space, is what he said, like a lot of my students' brains. And so the, the electrons, the, or the alpha particles that he shot, went straight through the atom, which meant most of the atom was empty space. But some of them bounced off of that nucleus in that center. Well, he didn't know where to put those electrons. Those electrons, he said, were in this outside space. That was a big disadvantage of his model, and that brings us to the Bohr model or the planetary model, which proposed that these electrons were in orbits, kind of like uh, it was kind of a solar system model. But it, the, the problem was we, we knew these electrons jumped specific quantum or energy levels but you know, from scientific experimentation, but we didn't know... Uh, th 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 there was no ability to find out exactly where these electrons are because the electrons uh, were were moving. They were constantly moving at the speed of light. And that brings us to our current model, which is called the quantum or the Schrodinger model or the electron cloud theory that shows the electrons not in orbits, but in orbitals. It gives the best probability for where those electrons are because we can't know exactly the speed or the, or, or the position of the electron. And so this is still widely accepted today that our electrons are in what we call orbitals, not in or specific orbits there, okay? And that is our views of the atom. And you can see our, that brings us to our periodic table. Our periodic table, you can see, is an increasing what we call atomic number. You can see hydrogen has an atomic number of one, which means one proton. So the atomic number... The atomic number is the number of protons, the number of protons. You can see helium has two protons. Lithium's got three. 
four, five, all the way. And so our periodic table is arranged in increasing atomic number or number of protons. Something like copper has 29 protons. And you can see that works out as we go along. Well, you can see chlorine. Chlorine has 17 protons here, 17 protons. Every chlorine atom has 17 protons. If it has 18 protons, it's a different element. If it's got 16 protons, it's a different element. If it has 17 protons, it is chlorine. So all chlorine atoms have the same number of protons, the same atomic number. But there are some chlorines that, that this is what Dalton didn't know, some chlorines have different masses. Some of those elements of those atoms have different masses. Just like uh, everyone would be, everyone that's in pre-AP chemistry is not the same age. They're all students in pre-AP chemistry, but they're not the same age. You can see we have chlorine 35, which means 35 means it has 17 protons, and chlorine 37 has 17 protons, the same number of protons. But they have a different mass. The mass is 35. The total mass is 35. And this total mass is 37, which tells us they have a different number of neutrons. You can see this has 20 neutrons, which adds up to a mass of 37. That's the total mass. But this is only going to have 18 neutrons, which adds up to a total mass of 35. So you can see an isotope is the same element, same number of protons, same atomic number, different mass or different number of neutrons there. And we call that an isotope. But we can also have what's called ions, ions. You can see copper here has 29 protons, 29 protons. But you can see this copper it has a zero charge. If you don't see anything, it's a zero charge, which means a zero charge means it is electrically neutral. That means this copper would have 29 positive protons and it would have 29 negative electrons. That cancels out to a zero charge. So if, uh, th that would be like copper metal. Any anything that's elemental, copper solid, copper liquid, copper gas, all has a charge or oxidation number of zero. You can see this charge of this copper has an oxidation number of positive one. What does positive one mean is, well, if it has 29 protons, because copper always has 29 protons, that means it would have 28 electrons. Who won out, the positives or negatives? The positives won out by one. So you can see, this copper lost an electron. It lost a negative. When you lose negatives, it becomes positive. So that would be a positive one charge right there. This copper has 29 protons, 29 positive protons, but it would only have 27 electrons because this one lost, this copper lost two electrons. And so you can see 29 positives, 27 negatives gives you a positive two charge. If something had a negative charge, let's say something like fluorine, and let's come back to take a look at fluorine. Fluorine has nine protons there, nine protons on our periodic table. So fluorine would have nine positive protons. Let's say fluorine's got a negative one charge, and so it would have one more electron. It would have 10 electrons. You can see which one won out. The 10 negative electrons won out, and so that ion would be negative one charge. And so an ion is the same number of protons, same element, different charge or different number of electrons. And that shows us what, how we normally write these things. You can see they put the atomic number down here of 11. They put the, the atomic mass up here, which is the number of protons and the neutrons. All the mass is in the nucleus. The protons and the neutrons are in the nucleus of the atom. So all that mass, basically all that mass, is in the neutrons. We basically say that electrons have no mass at all. You can, you know neutrons are neutral, so they don't have any charge, which means this tells us the overall charge or oxidation number of the relationship between the protons and the electrons, and this is how we normally write it. Now, we don't really have to put this 11 here because sodium tells us every sodium atom has 11 protons there. And last to mass spectroscopy. When you see mass spectroscopy, you think isotopes. Why do we think isotopes is, isotopes is our, that, that's our atomic mass, isn't it? That's the number of protons and the number of neutrons because all the mass is in the nucleus. All that mass is in the nucleus. And you can see this shows us different isotopes. It shows us a different 
mass, mass spectroscopy. You can see there's three isotopes to this element. There's, and I'm going to label this element X28, X29, and X30. There's three isotopes for this element. You can see the most abundant, the most abundant, abundant is X28, because you can see there's the most amount of these isotopes in this atom, in this overall atom. You can see, let's let's try to, to take a look at our percentages, okay? So this is going to be about, let, let, me, let me call that 92%, 92 parts out of 100. This guy right here, uh, maybe 5%, which means this would leave about 3%, right? And of course, I'm just kind of spitballing it here. And uh, it's a pretty good, pretty good guesstimation right there. So how would I find out the, the average atomic mass? Well, I would take the mass, which is 28, times by the percentage, 92 out of 100, or 0.92. I could call this 92 out of 100 if you wanted, or 0.92. I'm going to add the mass of 29, and that's going to be 5 part parts out of 100, or 0.05. And the mass of 30. And that's three parts out of 100, 0.03. And when I add all of this up, I get 28.1 for an average atomic mass, an average atomic mass. And if we go to my periodic table at the average atomic mass of 28.1, you can see right here, 28.1 would be silicon, okay? Silicon has an average mass of 28.1. You can see that 20, that's actually 28.085, but you can see that means the isotopes would be very close to 28, but you're going to have a little bit of maybe 29 and 30, just like we saw in our mass spectroscopy. Something like something like uh, manganese, you can see right here, manganese has an average of 54.938, which means that probably has an isotope. The isotope of manganese 55 would be the most abundant isotope probably, okay? But there's there's other isotopes, which gives us in average. And that's what mass spectroscopy does. Mass spectroscopy gives us the average atomic mass and it's dealing with isotopes. Well, that is week one for unit one atomic structure for pre-AP chemistry. I'll see you guys in class. Bye.